So we are in session 20. We'll continue with C-Sharp 2.0 features in this session, which covers uh, null coalizing op operators, delegate changes, so the delegates have been there uh, since 4.0, so there have been a couple of changes. What are they? What are the enhancements in delegates? We'll see. And what is the delegate inference? Covariance and contravariance, anonymous methods, captured variables. So all of these will cover in this session. Okay, so let's kick off. Uh, and now the continuation to the um, features, uh, the 2.0 new features, uh, is the null coalizing operator. So the null coalizing operator is a uh, is a little interesting operator, and uh, to know about this, we'll have some little background of uh, other operators and how can be using. It. Remember, this is again a new operator that can reduce the code amount of code that you write. So 2.0, the features that are added up are to uh, help your programming uh, language to simplify um, a couple of operations. So this is all based on uh, how you can make use of them or based on the context, how you can make use of them all def uh, depends on how you're making use of them. Okay. So this is again uh, related to the nullability of a value type. So, uh, and especially with the null coalescing operator, so to check the nullability of a value type, you either can use the uh, if else statement the way we used in the previous session, a previous uh, uh, case uh, here, uh, to check the nullability of a, a uh, nullable type, we can make use of an if uh, has value property directly, or if it is not a uh, nullable type, you can always make use of the is equal to uh, is equal to operator, the, uh, the comparison operator. Uh, in this case, uh, we have a compare or using the comparison operator or if and else with the comparison operator, yeah. And uh, or the condition operator, there's something called a condition operator where is, uh, so we'll see all those three cases, how can we check. So the first case here is uh, using the if else and the comparison operator. Okay, so in this case, uh, we have a, a nullable type, ABC, ABC are three or they are uh, int nullable types, and we're assigning A as a null value explicitly and B with some value. Okay, so what we're doing is we want to check uh, uh, the condition is, uh, here what we're trying to achieve uh, is uh, return uh, a non-null value if uh, A is null, uh, so at the uh, bottom of the tree, we are trying to get the default value out. So the default value is here b is a default value five, and if a is not a null, then return a. Otherwise, uh, return the default value, which is b. So b is a five. So b is like a hard coded value or a constant value, uh, in which case you want to use a default value, right? So that's the simple logic that we're going to achieve. How can you write such a simple logic? by using the if and comparison operator. If uh, considering that um, uh, in uh, ABC, uh, AB or A is not a nullable type. In other words, I can, in this example, A since A is a nullable type, I can still also make use of A dot has value, right? So considering that A is not a, a nullable type, uh, I can make use of the comparison operator, which is is equal to, is equal to. And check if it is null, then um, C return B, which is uh, B, else uh, C is A. Okay, so finally you print the C out and C will be fine, definitely. Okay, so this is one way of implementing that code. And the second uh, second way is the using the condition operator, question and colon. Oh, this is semicolon, so um, this is actually colon. Um, okay, read as a colon. In this case, what we're doing is, uh, we'll see is equal to, so this is a whole uh, set of uh, sta uh, statement from here, from here to here. So what it says, A is equal to is equal to null question, that's the condition, okay? So this is the condition that you're checking. Instead of if and else, we are making a little shortcut here. So uh, using question mark, that means the, the left hand side is a condition, and then the right hand side is a true uh, true part and false part, okay? So if this condition is true, then written B. 
else written a so that's what this line statement of uh, this statement means so this is a condition operator you can actually make use of this in case of this kind of a small operations right and uh, uh, yeah as I mentioned so we, uh, on the left hand side of the question mark stands the condition check on on the right hand side uh, before the column will be the true part and the, after the column is the false part so in this case it's the same as if a is equal to null uh, written b otherwise written a okay so and the, again the result will be uh, again fine because uh, a is null and b is default value is 5. So this is another short form of writing uh, the same piece of code. And now comes the uh, null coalizing operator. So this is again a further shortcut to uh, what we have as a condition operator. So this is stands for with the double double question marks. So this is exactly same. The same whole statement can be written as uh, a null coalizing operator b. So what this means is if A is null, then it will return B, otherwise return A. So that's what it means. So it's going to check, uh, it's going to ensure that you're going to get the, uh, a definite number, uh, if uh, at least a default value out. And the next thing is the null coalescing operator is an associative. Uh, so associative in sense, uh, uh, I hope you already know what's an associative principle. It's um, A, uh, a, B, C is equal to an A within brackets B and C. So you evaluate B and C first and uh, the resultant is evaluated with the A. So, or uh, A and B you evaluate first and then evaluate the result with the B, with C. So either way it's going to be same. So it's that, that's the associative principle, right? So if you remember um, the your associative principle is. So this is going to be like um, uh, like an operator operating on an operands. Uh, the behavior uh, can be associative. So how are we going to make use of this? So using associative, uh, sorry, using the coalescing operator, uh, you can um, just make this A question question B. Okay, see, so it's a very, very short form of uh, uh, writing the whole set of things. So this is going to be very useful when you're doing this operation very frequently in your code. And uh, uh, yeah, just need to keep in mind that you have a null coalescing operator, and this is again specific to the null. Okay, because this is if a is null, uh, that's the unity check. So in this case, a must be a nullable type. If it is not a nullable type, then this is not going to be uh, working. So that's why it's called a null coalescing operator. So we'll see a quick demo of this null coalescing operator. Okay, so in this example, I just have the same piece of example. The, in the first case, we are making use of the if and uh, um, comparison operator. And the uh, in the second case, we are making use of the uh, condition operator, which is question and column. And in the third case, we are making use of the coalescing operator. Okay. So in three of these cases, the result is same, which is five. Good. So since there is a null cannot be printed out, uh, we are seeing blanks over there. Uh, so whatever the blank means, that's null. Okay, so what will happen if uh, B is also a null? Okay, so what should happen if B is also a null? Uh, and if, uh, let's see what will happen. Okay, so then we can have a trail and error and see uh, what's going to happen. Okay, just run this off. Okay, so we just received null. If B is also null, in other words, it returns B, right? So because the condition check for the first instance itself is A is equal to null, then return B, right? So B it is returning B irrespective of check on B. It's not checking if B is null or not. So the condition check is always on A. If A is null, then return B. So it doesn't matter if B is null or not null, okay? So in, in in most of the common usage of this uh, logic, it goes uh, very, very frequent in terms of if you have a properties uh, uh, defined to your class and you want to have some default um, values to your properties, 
uh, then th this is the best way to implement and this is a very shortcut way to implement with the co-aliasing operator and make them nullable types and use the question question operator to ensure that the uh, the get the getter implementation of your property always returns a default value even if the uh, assignment has a null value okay so this is uh, going to be very very useful and um, although it's a uh, very small okay imagine if you have a uh, uh, 20 classes and each of the classes have some type of uh, nullable types like this and each of them you want to specify a default value so instead of writing the if and else everywhere if you just have to write a default um, a question question B, it's going to be very very short form and helps you in uh, writing the code much faster right and it doesn't have any performance impact it's uh, uh, it's going to be much faster than if and else um, statement okay so we're going to continue with the next topic Hope you are clear with that. Uh, it's very straightforward, nothing complicated about it. If you have any questions, just drop a line. And next comes the very important topic again, and a little more <coughs> complicated. Uh, we did talk about the delegates in our previous session, and the C# 2.0 brings in uh, three different or uh, three very important changes uh, to the delegates. So uh, just before we get into the changes uh, introduced in 2.0. Uh, for a uh, for betterment, not for the um, thing. So, what are the what are those betterments? Uh, so, before we get jump into this, well, let's walk through what is a delegate in the, that we discussed in the previous sessions. Uh, hope definitely uh, most of you might have uh, forgot what is a delegate completely. Um, so, okay, the delegates uh, again. The recapping on the delegates. Um, so delegate is a uh, a function pointers in uh, when you compare to the C sharp or sorry C plus plus, and uh, so in in VB dot net delegates are much rich than uh, just a C plus plus function pointers. Wherein the delegates in uh, C sharp, especially in dot net, not specific to C sharp, but they are also available in the other languages like VB dot net. Uh, delegates are rich in sense of they are object oriented. You can have delegates. Um, uh, implemented as an interfaces and, uh, or as an abstract members and that can be ex uh, extended to the other members so it's completely object oriented in uh, C sharp and also they are uh, type safe um, so C++ it's not type safe so as long as you have the address or some method you can just invoke it uh, invoke it at runtime any, any time so in .NET it's type safe uh, that means the, the signature uh, of the method should always match with the signature of the delegate. So that's the um, strong type safety that it checks for. So there are simple three steps to how you can create a delegate. Uh, the first step is to declare a delegate uh, using the delegate keyword and provide the signature. It doesn't have any me um, method implementation. And the steps two will be binding the methods to the delegate. So when you create a method, um, you, you when you create an instance of this delegate. Okay, so when you're binding, you're going to create an instance of the start delegate. The start delegate is the uh, delegate uh, that you have created here. And when you create the instance of that, so this is an instance of the delegate, and you're associating a an instance method. Uh, or in, in other words, you're binding the instance method to this de delegate and invoke it. So the third step is invoke it. You invoke it using the uh, the delegate instance dot invoke method. And the parameter that you're passing in will be the parameter uh, or set of parameters that the delegate is going to take. So if you carefully check the um, yeah, in this case, we don't have the definition of the start method. The start method is going to take a parameter of type string, and that's what we're passing in to invoke. Okay. And this is the code example. Um, I, I can run this code again and show you for uh, for better clarity. So in this case, uh, this is the delegate that is uh, declared with a name, a start delegate, and a parameter of type string <coughs> sorry and uh, we have a static method here uh, which is uh, matching the same signature one and also we have a car 
and the car has an instance method. So if you, you, you uh, hope you understand what is a uh, static versus instance method, right? So static methods are uh, can exist uh, within the class and they are not associated to an instance of the given class, whereas the instance methods are associated to the instance of a given class, whereas in this case, OBJ Nissan is an instance of car. Okay, so the start method is an instance method because it is accessed using the instance of that class. So whereas a static method here is a little different. It is accessed directly using the class name. Whereas in this case, if you see the static method here, it is accessed using the class name. So it is associated to the class Y because the static members have only one memory allocated for the entire instance, number of instances of the given class. Okay, so we did cover that topic several times. Um, so if you're really uh, clear with that, it's fine. Otherwise, uh, let me know. And yes, so this is a plus is equal to operator. We're going to use the increment assignment operator, in other words, um, is used to uh, associate multiple methods. In this case, we are actually associating the multiple methods to the same delegate uh, associated to the respective instance of the class, whereas OBJ Nissan, OBJ Toyota, OBJ Honda, uh, and, and and the static method. So you, uh, as this example shows that it's actually associating a public method of a given instance as well as a static method of a local class implementation. All it cares whether is that the the class ha is having the respective signature or not. The signature is check is done, type safety is done, and that's it. So it doesn't care about uh, the associated access modifiers of the given method. And once you invoke, the output is pretty clear. So it could able to uh, invoke the uh, these three instance member uh, methods, and the last one is the static method. Okay, so that's about the delegate overview and and the other one here shows that the, by default the delegate is a multicast delegate. Okay. Okay, and also to remove a given um, uh, method from the um, from the delegate queue, you can actually use the decrement assignment operator minus is equal to. Okay, so that's the uh, overview of the delegates. So the reason why I recapped is that we have more changes or additions to the uh, delegates uh, in general in the pre, uh, in available in the 1.0 or 1.1 framework. So we can run the the old example first and then compare what are the changes we have. Okay so only thing is that we are creating an instance of the um, delegate here <coughs> and associating the respective method using the new keyword, right? A new instance of the start delegate and passing the method. And similarly, here, if you see, if we see the new instance every every time. Right? So we're creating, going to create a new instance of the uh, delegate and associating that to with the respective method and uh, adding to the queue using the plus is equal to operator. And similarly with the new start delegate. So that's the, uh, the 1.1 or 1.0 version uh, of a delegate usage. And there's nothing wrong with this. It's pretty much good and it's pretty re um, readable code and uh, it's perfect. So what are the new additions uh, to make delegates more useful? So the first delegate, uh, first change is here is the delegate uh, inference. So there is a delegate inference created um, so which will uh, uh, using which you can actually the delegate itself when you associate a method to it it going to do a inference check uh, whether this associated method uh, matches the the signature given or not. The, uh, the second one is the call, uh, covariance and contravariance and the third one is the anonymous methods. So all these uh, three are very important, uh, uh, especially they are introduced in 2.0 but they uh, they have a more weight in 3.0. Um, so the delegate inference overview, overview, so again what's an inference? Probably this is a new keyword that we have uh, uh, getting introduced to, right? So uh, inference again is a very, very uh, good feature. 
uh, it's pretty much like a var type right so a var variance type or uh, data types that you're making use of it uh, can be inferred implicitly uh, in, in a simple example would be if you when you're typing an integer data type like int i you specify that i is of type int right uh, in uh, type inference you need not actually so whenever you have uh, say just a variable say i is equal to 10 simply so when you say i is equal to 10 based on the value that you're assigning to i uh, the type is inferred by the compiler so it's going to say that okay i is of type integer so going forward wherever you may, you're making use of the i variable uh, it will be of type integer only so you can actually declare that as a var keyword and assign uh, var i is var stands for variant so based on the value that you assign for the first time to that variable the type is inferred by the compiler and uh, henceforth it's going to be type safe okay so we will talk about the delegate inference now so in this case right so in the previous example we have seen uh, how do we associate a method to a delegates by using the new operator right so in this case the type in uh, delegate inference it's going to make use of without using the new delegate types so um, in this case uh, if you look at this other example so this can be used with events example uh, directly plus is equal to the the method name directly so if you say click handler is one of the method available and you can actually directly associate it uh, without using the new um, delegate type so in the uh, we'll see the how the example looks like okay so this is how the old style and new style looks okay so in this case uh, delegate I have some action delegate here and um, this some action I have a named method here so this is again um, I will start using the um, the new word called named method okay so because we'll see um, its difference when we talk about the rest of the topics so yeah here I have a named method which means it has a method method that has a name to it okay and this is static um, and this is, has a name and it doesn't return anything that's why it's void so since it doesn't return anything there is no written keyword in the body it's going to write just simply console write line okay so uh, uh, be aware of all these uh, small things uh, associated to a method so th they make a big difference okay so that's the standard way uh, a method exists right so that's why it's uh, a standard way is called as a named method and in this case the old style is uh, associating this method using the new keyword right so new delegate name and passing the method since say hello is part of the same uh, class so it's been referred directly and uh, also we are accessing the uh, say hello from the static member itself so it's good so uh, either you can uh, refer it directly or you can actually refer with dele uh, delegate cha uh, delegate changes class name dot the method so the class name dot method will be ideal for a static member okay this is fine in the new uh, delegate inference uh, when you do a delegate inference you can actually without using the new keyword you can directly assign the value is like is equal to so you create an instance of the um, delegate and assign the method directly so this piece of code is gone so new is gone it's completely so you just have to assign it directly so this is a delegate inference so inference means when I when you assign the method directly so the delegate is going to check the type of delegate that you're passing in okay so here we are actually specifying the type of the de uh, delegate that you're passing in by creating instance of that delegate so here we are not uh, doing that so we are directly assigning the method so when you assign the method the type inference is done by the compiler at the design time itself to ensure that this method matches the signature that is laid out for the delegate okay so that's that's what the type inference mean we'll see the uh, very good example with the same old example and how we can uh, see the difference with the new way uh, the inference 
Okay, so here's the same piece of code uh, that we have demonstrated earlier, and the uh, it has the same uh, methods, uh, uh, the static method available here, and also the static method available here to this and the same three instances OBJ Nissan and same three instances the same piece of code actually um, and the only difference here is the delegate inference so if you see the delegate inference is used here in this case we have uh, directly assigned the OBJ Nissan start and also Toyota, Nissan, Toyota and uh, Honda uh, directly so in this case we are actually making use of the respect to uh, delegate type instance and pass the method to it. So this is uh, the natural way of using the delegate and this is using the delegate inference. So this uh, is available in 2.0 onwards. And similarly for static met, uh, members um, we can directly assign the method name from accessing from the class name. And whereas in this case we made use of the new statement. And of course, when we uh, try to remove it, remove the respective method, uh, it's the same thing. We just pass the uh, method name directly for any instance name. So in this case, it was uh, creating new respective types. So the type inference is pretty much works with the delegates as well. Okay, so that's uh, the new in. So that's what the arrow show, and we'll have a quick demo. Okay, um, yeah, so the only difference with the type inference here is the association of the methods using the direct is equal to uh, versus uh, using the new start delegate passing the method, right? So this was the old way to do and now we can avoid specifying the which which type of the delegate that you're passing and pass the method directly such that the compiler itself is going to make sure the assigned method maps to the uh, the signature of the start delegate or not. Okay, so that's what the uh, delegate inference uh, is and uh, we use the same thing everywhere wherever we are assigning the values, right? So it's a pretty simple straightforward code. <coughs> And it works perfectly, so there are no issues uh, using the type inference or uh, delegate inference as well. Okay, so it works the same way uh, as it used to be. No issues, and no uh, hidden uh, uh, performance uh, lags here. Everything works perfectly normal. Okay, next comes the covariance and the contravariance. So this is again a, a very interesting feature. This is especially useful uh, when uh, when we implement the patterns, especially the factory method patterns or the abstract method pattern, which are creational design patterns. Okay, so here the uh, covariance. Uh, what the covariance is all about? So if you see the background of the how the delegates work, so delegates are very strict type safety right so you it um, the 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 standard thumb rule, thumb rule is that the signature of the delegate must match to the method signature right so that's the thumb rule that a de, uh, a, a, the delegate has which makes it more type safe but uh, in, when you in, when deal with uh, like a creational patterns in uh, in general uh, which are very very useful patterns and uh, which again I don't want to elaborate on that topic but um, um, so when you talk about the uh, design pattern implementation that's going to be very basic limitation to make use of delegates um, so that limitation is eradicated using the uh, covariance and contravariance so the covariance what it means is the uh, means that if a delegate is declared to return a base type so uh, here again uh, strictly object oriented so uh, just again to recap on the object oriented basics uh, if you see the bottom most uh, class diagram here I just added this to just to recap on the uh, on the inheritance uh, hierarchy uh, in this case the automobile is an abstract class which is the base class right so because if you see the arrow pointing from the left uh, uh, to sorry from right to left uh, 
the car is a derived class, it is a concrete class, since it is not an abstract, so it's a concrete class which is inheriting from automobile. So the arrow shows that this is the base class. So in this case, uh, automobile becomes the base class to a car class and uh, also you can name, you can call the automobile as the super class or the parent class. So all of, all stand same. So um, so and the child class is car or a derived class in general. So this is a parent-child relationship or or a base class and derived class relationship, right? And if you see the flying car here, so is this is in the third level. So this is the first level uh, inheritance. So this is the second level inheritance. Um, so again, so this is how you can actually alternatively you can actually achieve the multiple inheritance again. So we did talk about the multi-level inheritance and this is a pretty good example of a multi-level inheritance. And the flying car is actually inherited from car uh, when car is internally inherited from automobile. So flying car will have both the, uh, both the members of car and also automobile. So that's the uh, multiple inheritance you're achieving using multi-level inheritance. But it's uh, not a direct multi multiple inheritance. Uh, when, a di when a direct multiple inheritance happens, uh, you're actually going to inherit from two different classes at the same time. So it's not the case here. So which C sharp doesn't support. Right. Okay, so just a recap on the object oriented. So now we'll uh, get into the uh, covariance. What a covariance means? Um, that covariance means that if a, if the delegate is declared uh, to return a base type, an instance can be created using a method uh, which is which is declared to return a type derived from it. So that means in this case, if my uh, we'll see in, a, in the next example, probably that will help you a lot. Um, okay, so we'll just cover the definition of it. So that means the uh, the return type of a delegate, if it is automobile in this case, that means it is a base type, right? So automobile is a base type. That uh, in in that case, when you when you actually have a method implement to associate to that given delegate, that method can actually return any type that derives from that base type. You got it. So if the given method can actually uh, return a car class when the delegate is returning an automobile. So because they have, they are part of the same family, uh, so the objects within the inheritance hierarchy are correlated to each other uh, with the inheritance. Um, our generaliz generalization uh, principle, right? So they are interrelated to each other. So the type is always derived from a given uh, derived type. So that's why they can be interchangeably used on in place of one of the other. So that's why in uh, uh, delegates uh, that uh, is relaxed using the covariance. So covariance talks about uh, returning a, a subtype of uh, uh, objects uh, in the method implementation when the delegate has a base type implementation. Okay, we'll probably you'll understand this uh, in detail when we see the code example. And the parameter types. So what are the parameters that you're going to have uh, to the given delegate can be contravariance. So this is just an opposite to it. Uh, contravariance uh, uh, means that if delegate parameter is declared to be derived type, so if you declare it as a derived type, that means in this case a flying car. So if, it, uh, if the delegate takes a parameter of type flying car, okay, then it, you can actually um, uh, an instance can be created uh, using a method which has a base type for that parameter. So you can actually create a method uh, that has a base type again. So the parameter is having a derived type, but you can create a method, concrete method, that you can associate to the uh, that um, delegate that is accepting any of the base types. So there's covariance and contravariance. So covariance is left to right and contravariance is right to left. So the parameters have the contravariance and the written type has a covariance. And uh, yes, in this example, we're going to make use of this relationship, this example, which we have popularly used in object-oriented programming. Okay, so I'm just putting that on the top uh, again to uh, match the example. So this might be a little uh, confusing, but try to follow. So in this case, uh, this is the delegate signature. So if you carefully observe, 
the, uh, the delegate return type is automobile, right? So the delegate is returning an automobile type and it is actually taking a flying car as a parameter. So this is a, uh, this example is going to talk about the, uh, this part is a parameter of the get an automobile uh, delegate. So this is the delegate again uh, with the delegate keyword. So this is the delegate which takes a flying car as a parameter and returns an automobile. Okay, so uh, how can you make use of such things in a real-time code? Uh, we'll see at the end of it. Okay, don't really worry about it at this point. Um, so at this point, I concentrate on what it is returning and what it is taking. So that's important here. So in this case, it's uh, returning a base type in our uh, inheritance hierarchy and it is taking the derived class as a parameter. Right, so that's the key thing here. So this is the derived class and this is the base class in the entire inheritance hierarchy, right? And what next? So in this code example, if you see, this is the static method. This is my uh, concrete method that I'm, I want to associate to the given delegate, right? So take a close look to this signature. So this uh, concrete member is actually taking car is returning a car and also taking a car okay whereas the delegate signature is take, returning an automobile and taking a flying car okay so this is possible following the covariance whereas whereas covariance says that if the delegate signature is a base type so the concrete members or the methods can return any of the derived types because they all form part of the same family, right? You can actually return the uh, any any member of the derived types. In this case, I can even write a method that can return a flying car because flying car is also a derived class of automobile. Okay, so they are all related to the same family. And at the same time, it can take a car because when I talk about the contravariance, uh, when the parameter type is a derived type, it can, the concrete method implementation can take any of the members of its base types. For example, in this case, it's taking a flying car as a parameter, whereas its base type is car. So in this case, it's car. In, at the same time, um, it can also take automobile uh, as a parameter because automobile is also a base class. Okay, at a different level, but it's still a base class to flying car. So in this case, it's, we have only two levels. In real time world, you might have n levels. Um, you can have uh, unimaginable uh, levels of uh, inheritance hierarchy. So, um, so it doesn't matter here. So you, uh, when you have, there's a flying car here and there's another level of inheritance, another class, which is derived from flying car, that's still fine. So as long as the automobile it returns and uh, this is the base type that is returning, uh, you can write any methods that can uh, return the, uh, the derived members as long as they derive from this base class. And similarly, uh, you can have it written, a, you can accept any type as long as they are base types to the given parameter type. Okay, so that's uh, what it means. And in this case, uh, when we are making use of it, so this is where the covariance is done in the first uh, case and the contravariance is done in the second case. Whereas covariance is uh, delegate signature written space type, whereas the method returns derived type. Okay, and the contravariance uh, delegate signature takes a derived type as a parameter, whereas the method returns its space type. Okay, so that's what the key thing about the covariance and contravariance. Another thing is the static member that we are associating to the get an automobile de uh, delegate. So this is an instance of the get an automobile. Um, just to give a long name so to be make it more meaningful, and uh, and we are associating that directly using the Again, it says interface, but again, inference. Okay, delegate inference. Read that as an inference. So this is a wrong statement there. Okay, so we're associating that to the delegate and then invoking the 
delegate here. So when we invoke in the delegate, if you see that the return type of that invoke is an automobile, we are actually catching the return type as an automobile type, and where and also we are passing the parameter as a flying car. Okay, but we are at our signature of the but our static static method signature was actually taking car and returning car, right? So this method, when we associate to the delegate and invoke it, we're actually passing a flying car and actually expecting it to return an automobile because it matches the signature of the delegate, right? The signature of the delegate says automobile and flying car, right? And that's what happens when we invoke it. So it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter to what level. So what it matters is that the uh, the covariance and contravariance rules match. Okay, so that's what it is. And the output, if you carefully check the output, it makes a perfect sense. So since I'm passing the flying car here, right? So the output, uh, if you see the, okay, let me take a little right here. Yep. So this is what I'm trying to write out. So this is the parameter that I'm coming, uh, receiving as a car type. So I'm, I'm, I'm receiving this flying car as a type car here. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm uh, typing uh, or printing out its uh, base type. Two string will give you the name of that particular uh, instance. So what it is written out is a flying car. Okay, so that's, uh, if you carefully notice that, I passed a flying car and it is a flying car. Okay, and when I'm returning out, if you look, if you take a look at this statement, yes. So this is an automobile, right? So I'm uh, when I'm bringing out the value as my automobile, and I'm going to write the type of this my automobile, then it's going to write to you as a flying car, because we actually return the same my car out here, right? So we just return what we have received here, as simple as that. So your output is always matches what you have passed in. Since flying car is part of the inheritance hierarchy, all this is possible. Hope you understood what we have done, right? So same thing, we're going to see the runtime and see that if the theory does really work. Covariance and contravariance, so the names are self-explanatory. Okay, let me, okay, so we have one error, that means we, the main static word main, one of the more main is missing, and that's satisfied here. Okay, so the slide is going to be, be very useful to understand this, so in this case the delegate is, uh, so here uh, I did put the definition of what is a, con, a covariance and contravariance here, and the automobile, the delegate uh, is actually written an automobile class out, and the flying car, and these classes were uh, were actually in the business classes here. They are in this here, and the class diagram that I showed up uh, is here. So this is the class diagram for that. And um, if you want to take a look at the implementation of these classes, you can uh, definitely take a look at it. Uh, at this point, I can actually show it. Car is actually inheriting from automobile here, and the flying car. And uh, if you remember, there's one of the question that how do you inherit? So take a close look at this. So this is the colon symbol used to inherit, right? And also a flying car here, flying car is actually inheriting from car. Okay, so that's where it is. They are not. Okay, so we, we are, yeah, so we are at the business classes, so the classes are here. You can always uh, go to that implementation by using the go-to definition, right, as we have been doing. So in this case, right, we can say go-to definition or F12, which will take you to the class implementation, okay? Okay, so now we are not interested in what these classes are actually implementing, or we are interested in showing the covariance and contravariance behavior. So originally, the delegates have a strict type safe, uh, type check uh, uh, and, and in, using the covariance and contravariance, uh, it allows uh, the inheritance hierarchy, uh, the members of the inheritance hierarchy. So whereas the uh, covariance, when you have uh, the written type 
has a base type, it can actually return anything. So the method that you have here, it can return any member of the, any, any class that inherits from that uh, base member. Okay, so in this case, we are, have automobile there and we are actually returning car. And parameter-wise, covariance, contravariance. So the parameter is it's a contravariance wherein you, uh, the signature has a derived type and you can have uh, a method implemented to accept uh, any member uh, of its base types. So in this case, it could be automobile or it could be a uh, car. In this case, the example shows car as a, because car is a base type to flying car, okay? And uh, we, this method is doing pretty much nothing. It is just uh, writing uh, some text on, uh, on the screen and writing the va value that is received directly. Okay, so whatever you pass in, uh, we will get it out before and before it, you get it, it's going to write the type of object that we are received, right? So that has a good a good ex uh, example uh, when we bind this method, static method. Okay, so again, to make sure that this method is uh, definition is here. So it's gone, say go to definition, it will go to the piece of core where it is referring to. Okay, it's part of the same thing. And uh, automobile, when, it, when you invoke the member, it's actually returning an automobile of type and uh, my local variable, my automobile. If you see, it's not actually creating instance of it here. Automobile, my automobile is equal to directly invoking because the this method, uh, whatever we are associating here itself is actually returning a, uh, cl a class. But this car class is actually inheriting the automobile, right? So the automobile maps here. So that's when the, um, the covariance helps. Although this method is returning car, it can able to catch at the automobile, at the, at the high level definition of your delegate. And we're passing the instance of the flying car here and we see flying car out. You we'll see? Okay, so this is the, if you run the program, it shows um, the, both the flying car in and out. So uh, it's invoked the static method, it gets the flying car in and it returns the flying car out. Okay, so it's clear. Hope it's, uh, hope this explains. Okay. Again, if you have a question like, okay, when will you want to use the inference, right? Delegate inference and when you don't want to use it. If you have any such question, then that will be the best question, I would say. Um, so always, it doesn't mean that the, uh, the delegate inference replaces the old method, right? So this is one of the way to handle it. And uh, both have their own specific uh, conditions when you want to use the one versus the other. In this typical example, right, in this typical example, we are actually making use of the instance method rather than the uh, a uh, unnamed method. We'll see what is an unnamed method. In this case, instance method and that too that has a name with it. Um, and uh, the flying car is an instance that is passed, which are all completely object-oriented objects and uh, they are related to the classes that are already defined by you. So, and methods that you want to invoke on the uh, because the logic that you that is written to the respect to uh, implementation is different. Uh, so in those cases, whenever you're actually uh, trying to refer an instance methods in a delegate, it's always uh, good to go with the old old route wherein you specify which method uh, passing the respect to instance to it. If the lo if the code logic is there with you, then um, you definitely can't go with the uh, inference. Uh, um, so whenever you have the, uh, whenever you want to specify the respective method that is already implemented, then you can always go with the uh, named approach where, wherein you pass the new flying car in this case, you pass the respective parameters to it and you can instead of invoke it directly. And uh, wherever, uh, yeah, uh, in this case, right, uh, wherever you want to make use of a uh, direct behavior, uh, make use of a, a same method, right? Whenever you're making use of the same method throughout the uh, code and you really don't care about which instance you want to pass in. So in those cases, uh, you can straight away use the uh, delegate inference. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the other cases, you can actually make use of the older way of where you specify the respect to delegate and passing the method to it.
So there are occasions where you need to use the old way and in most of the occasions you can still go with using the uh, uh, delegate inference. Okay. Okay, and the we did the covariance and contravariance at this point. Okay, so next comes the anonymous methods. The anonymous methods is again a very um, useful topic. Uh, in this case, uh, as I've been talking about the named methods, so anonymous methods are anon uh, unnamed or non-named methods. That means they doesn't have any name. How can a method be without a name? Yes, it can be. So this is uh, again a very concise way to avoid uh, writing methods. Okay, so we'll see step by step. So creating anonymous methods is essentially a way to pass a code block as a delegate parameter. So, so far we have been passing the method name as a delegate parameter, right, so far. And uh, using anonymous methods, you can actually, again, uh, get rid of the, uh, the method, type, method name. You can actually pass a code of that respective method directly as a, to a delegate. So that's what uh, uh, the anonymous methods comes into play. So again, so a method cannot exist on its own without a name, right? If whenever you're defining a method signature and its body, uh, that code have to be part of a, a some method, right? So in this case, uh, uh, when you talk about anonymous methods, that means the method has no name. You can actually pass that uh, directly as a code, code block. And how will you do that? Uh, we'll see. Excuse me. And anonymous methods are non-named again as I discussed the same thing it doesn't have any name or a signature that means it doesn't have a signature that means it doesn't have a written type or a parameter set that's going to take care so you can just pass the uh, method block how we'll see by using anonymous methods you reduce the coding overhead in instantiating delegates by eliminating the need to create a, special, a separate method yeah, so where are you going to make use of this? Okay, this is going to be again a good question. And if at all actually you're making use of instance methods, so this is not the option. So if at all there is a case where you're uh, having, uh, creating a multiple instances of the delegate uh, using a threading concept uh, and you want to perform the same set of operations uh, um, on the fly. Um, so in, in, the, in those cases you can uh, make use of the anonymous methods and the, another very good example for making use of anonymous methods is uh, the compare. Um, if, if you remember we did uh, use the iComparable interface to implement the compare method uh, and pass that respective class which is implementing the iComparable interface as a parameter uh, to compare two different uh, collections, right? So in those cases, we actually did a lot of things. We did, we did declare a class that implements iComparable interface and then override and implement the, the compare method which takes two or uh, x as an object, y as an object and we are ensuring that uh, we did implement this with the person class uh, wherein we are checking to both the, uh, uh, both the um, bo two different objects to compare and see which one comes first and which one comes next. That's especially used internally to compare two different objects by the, uh, the uh, with respect to the hash table. Uh, when we add the person as a key to it, it's going to sort it using the respective implementation. So we, instead of writing such a long class and do that, you can actually directly pass that logic to compare two different objects as an inline f function. So when you do an inline function, you don't you avoid writing the big class, implementing that interface, and providing the compare override and all that stuff. Uh, so in those cases, it's going to be more concise, right? So it's going to be one time one time writing, of course. And in this case, also you can um, you, you you write it only one time and only for that specific uh, logic. And rest of the logic you don't really care. It's not a reusable code, in other words. Uh, then you can actually make use of the anonymous methods on the fly. You can add that uh, anonymous method directly. In going forward in the in the later uh, topics like alumni expression is more concise than the anonymous methods again. So uh, and when uh, the, when you use alumni expressions, you can actually pretty much make use of it 
um, uh, when we do deal with the link. So in using link, you can actually uh, use the, the same database query operations like where clause if you want to provide, or sorting clause if you want to provide, order clause, so on. You can pass those expressions directly um, for the respect to uh, select statements or uh, filter statements and so on. So it's pretty much like writing the database query in the .NET language using the uh, lambda expressions. So the anonymous methods is a starting point to that route. So how can you achieve that? Uh, pass in the direct code block. Uh, if you see the code snippet here, so this is how you can do it. So it's uh, in this case um, some action. So in this case, this is anonymous method to a delegate, and this delegate doesn't take any parameter. So it's parameterless delegate, uh, which has a signature, but the signature is not visible here. So there is no signature here, right? So the signature, of course, in this screenshot, it's not there, but there is a, a some action delegate, um, which is going to uh, return nothing, and also it's going to take no parameters. It's a void and do something. That's it. So do some action. That means in this case, instead of writing another method and passing the name of the method, in this case, we are just passing the code directly. Right? And how do you do that with the parameterized delegates? It's the same thing. So we just specify the parameter here delegate of parameter and then just pass the code directly. And if you see the parameter that is passed in is used here, MSC. So it's just like a method without a name. In this case, uh, the if you write a method uh, for this kind of class, for this kind of operation, then you would name say uh, void do something and takes string as a message. And within the code block, it's going to do the right line message, right? Uh, that's how we're going to write it. Otherwise, in, in this way, just create a delegate and um, pass the parameter set what it's going to take and then just pass, pass the code directly. So this is an anonymous method. So anonymous methods means no name, unnamed methods. Okay, so this is a, this is a, uh, a good example here. So we are trying to, uh, in this uh, code example, it's trying to show all three flavors so far what we have seen. Um, the first uh, flavor, is uh, using the delegate uh, inference. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is without using delegate inference, wherein so we are actually associating a method. Before we associate that, we'll look take a look at the delegate uh, type. It's a void. It returns nothing and do something, and doesn't take any parameters. Right? It's a parameterless delegate. And now uh, we have a, a method, a static method implemented here which matches this signature. It returns uh, wide and doesn't take anything. So th this one matches perfectly. And what it is doing, it's console or right line, hello. Okay, it can do hello only because it's not getting anything out, so it's just hello. And now, um, how we are associating this? Using the same old way uh, with the uh, new instance. In this case, we are specifying explicitly uh, that you're going to make use of the some action delegate, which is available here. Uh, which is my type of delegate and then pass the respective method name hello world or say hello sorry okay we're just passing the ma method name uh, say hello directly okay and then in the next case using the inference we're just passing the method directly the same method pass we, we're not specifying which uh, delegate type you want to make use of it so the delegate inference is going to ensure that it's going to use the correct one and in third case use the anonymous method so we just may we just writing the console dot write line directly here, and by saying delegate without any parameters, just do this. Okay, console dot write line hello. So there's no difference between the way you did here, uh, this whole thing. Okay, versus this method. Right. So this is a named method, whereas this is an unnamed method. Because it's, otherwise, it's the same thing. If you see the compare the signature here, hello world doesn't take any parameters and do something, right? So it doesn't take any parameter and it's just write the same line of code here. Okay? So that's what it is. And if you see the those are called associating uh, named methods to a delegate, you can do it using these two ways 
one is with the explicitly specifying the type of the delegate and other way, another one is the, uh, the delegate inference uh, directly associating the mem uh, method name uh, without specifying which type so the type inference is going to make sure that this uh, type is mapped to the type that we have declared in the delegate and the third one this is an unnamed one this is an, uh, this is an anonymous method okay and the output obviously doesn't make any difference because it's always writing hello here and also hello here so it uh, it's going to write the same thing out so we'll see that uh, how it's going to be so anonymous methods are really interesting uh, if you really understand that and uh, play around uh, there are uh, there is a very wide scope um, for anonymous methods but of course in 3. Oh, they were a little deprecated again, uh, but not exactly deprecated. I, would, I wouldn't say that. They are still available in 3.0, uh, but only that uh, there is a next uh, enhanced way to do uh, is the lambda expressions. We're going to see that as well in the forthcoming sessions. Okay, so this is, uh, okay, so in this case, I have both examples uh, written out. Uh, so right now, I'm going to take away the parameterized one. And we'll see the parameter less one first. Okay, so this example, some action doesn't return anything, doesn't take anything as a some action implementation where where is a some action method? Say hello, say hello is down here. So say hello is written here, which just say hello, which again doesn't take anything and doesn't return anything. And we are associating that using the uh, the inf uh, the old way wherein we specify the instance of the respective delegate type in the second one delegate inference we are not uh, associating the respective type but the compiler is uh, design time is going to make sure that the method is adhering to the signature that the delegate type is uh, pro uh, that the delegate type is provided and the third one is the the anonymous method way wherein we are just using the delegate keyword again here and defining no parameters and then the code block directly okay and just invoking that so all the three statements result are the same hello 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 okay so including the last one and we'll see the next part the next part is with the parameters so it's the same uh, set here, wherein this uh, delegate has an additional parameters that is a string. Okay, so some action with the string. And of course it has a concrete method called say hello with parameter. It takes a string as a parameter. And it's writing out what it is received, which is message, right? It's getting message and it's writing that message out. That's the only difference. This is just to demonstrate uh, that parameterized how you can do with an anonymous way. And in this case, uh, the old style, we are same way. We're creating instance of the respective delegate type and associating the method, static method in this case. And in the second case with the delegate inference, uh, we are directly associating and the compiler is going to ensure that the the delegate type is going to be inferred to the type that is specified as part of the sum action with parameter delegate. And the third one, how we're going to do with it, you're going to pass the parameter directly to the delegate and make use of the MSG in your code block directly. So you're going to take one parameter in and it's going to use that parameter in your code block. So uh, as simple as like if you have 10 different lines of code, you can straight away write 10 different lines of code here. There's no problem. Uh, it's the same C sharp language that you can put in there as a comma separator. Uh, you can have a semicolon to ensure that's the end of the line. And the same way, associating named methods to delegates, the same way with the, for the parameterized one. And uh, for parameterized anonymous methods, you can make use of it this way. 
Okay, so the output is going to be different because we're passing different va um, values in this case. So in this case, we will have actually passed the with using delegate uh, and the using delegate inference, and in this case, using anonymous methods. So we see three different outputs. Okay, in this case, this one and using delegate here this one and the without using uh, delegate inference so the, the three things that we see right so we'll see a quick demo it's going to be fun it's part of the same file code file okay just uncomment this part of the statement and it's of course self explanatory the same thing with action this para uh, if I do take it to the definition it takes a parameter there and uh, yes we are just uh, when we invoke it that time you're going to fill that parameter okay when, when you associate it you don't actually do it uh, pass the parameter when you invoke that time you're going to uh, fill in the parameter this could be a good question uh, for interviews um, um, uh, what time, at what time you want to pass parameter uh, for a delegate when you associate it. So when you associate it, you always associate the name of the method, not the signature, right? Um, so that's make a big difference. So in this case, um, the delegate has uh, taking a parameter, but the parameter you're going to pass only when you invoke it, not when you associate it. So when your uh, association or binding both mean same, uh, keep that in mind and we are again associating the uh, method say hello with parameter if you take a go to definition here you're going to see that it's taking a parameter but you're not actually passing the parameter when you're associating it so you're passing the parameter value when you're invoking it right yep. and the similarly same thing stands for the anonymous also so when you invoke you need to pass the parameter uh, value uh, and the signature wise when you're associating the uh, delegate method we can just straight away uh, pass this you can, if you have a, a 10 different parameters that you want to make use you can make use of it here and also you can make use of this code block if you see I can write the multiple statements here doesn't matter if I say another line I can do it here and I'll say right line I am done right so this is going to be in a new line and it's adding if you see there are two lines of code added up as an anonymous code block here and you can actually have a complete C sharp coding with conditions everything just like a normal method you can write um, it will work and that's the speciality of anonymous so if you see the I am done is written out in addition to the code that has been available so it's same method that you can uh, write down but without a name and without a, without a signature so there is no method that is declared so it's going to be used here only so that's one drawback is that the whatever code you're going to write here it's not reusable because it's not associated with a name so if you want to write a method or logic that you can reuse at multiple places then this is not the way to do it Okay, so then in that case, we have to go with the named approach, wherein uh, you, you can use either of these two approaches, wherein you associate, you write the logic in a, a separate method and pass that method name to it when you're associating it. Okay, so otherwise, this way is fine. A simple way uh, is like if you're if using a button click event, for example, button click event might be uh, only for that specific button click. You might not have that logic reused in multiple places, might not be. So in those cases, you can actually use an anonymous method, so no hurdle in that. Especially this is going to be very, very useful when you're playing with the links. Uh, when we talk about that uh, topic, then you, you will really make, uh, it really makes a very big use. Especially even in the collection handling, when you do a comparing two different objects, you can actually straight away pass the compare logic directly here. So that probably the compare logic might be uh, different from different situation. For, uh, in that case, you can actually have a, a dynamic logic created uh, here uh, that can make use of it uh, at runtime and dynamically. So uh, yeah, if in, the, in those cases, anonymous method is going to be very useful again. Okay, so um, I think we just done with this topic. 
we will move on to the next topic. I think the last topic for the day uh, would be the captured variables. Um, again, this is again, again, again a very good uh, topic. But again, probably um, uh, no, not something that you really wanted to uh, uh, use often. But it's going to be useful whenever again uh, the situation arises. The if you look at the background of the delegates with respect to to the anonymous methods, especially, uh, and again it refers to the older uh, definition of what a delegate is. Again, it refers to methods. Usually, methods. It doesn't matter the access modifier of the method in the and when you come to the anonymous methods, the method name itself is not there. So that means there is no access modifier to that method. So method is anonymous. So that's the second step. The first step, it doesn't really care about where the method is. All it cares of the address of the method. It could be a static method. It could be an instance method. It could be a completely a, a method that is coming from out of fly from a different uh, process area also that's fine as long as the that method uh, address area is created by the respective application that's fine um, uh, so it's just case about the method it doesn't matter whether it's public private protector friend or whatever internal doesn't matter um, so in that occasion when you combine that logic with respect to to the uh, anonymous methods uh, so anonymous methods are again uh, can be written on fly. So if your anonymous method is making use of any local variables, in this very example at the bottom, okay. In this example, if at the bottom, if you see, uh, this is the delegate which is accepting an int as a um, uh, parameter, x as a parameter. And the void main has a local variable called int n, which is initialized with zero. And in this case, this is an anonymous method, wherein int m, this uh, my delegate d is associating to an anonymous method, uh, which is making use of the n here. That's important here. So this anonymous method is making use of a local variable. Okay, this is of a private scope of a local variable and when you do this this delegate again so if this delegate is a public delegate right and uh, whoever have access uh, outside this code or outside this class or outside this assembly whoever have access to this delegate they actually know one way or the other way they are actually making uh, access in this int n Although, so that means uh, using a delegate, you're actually exposing the uh, private members outside the scope. And when this line of code happens, what happens internally, we'll see uh, in the uh, next slide. Okay. So that's uh, in this case. In, in this case, the int n becomes a captured variable, or in other words, called as an outer variable. So although this is private. Uh, by by scope, that means ideally it should end. It's uh, uh, n should not be available outside the main method and outside this class since it is private. So it's going to become a available outside the class again because uh, uh, it's a captured variable and it is being used by an anonymous method. So in, imagine a situation where uh, this is not available outside this method, but your your delegate is accessible outside this method because the delegate itself is uh, at the pu public level, right? So it's going to be public and it's outside the class. And anyone who is making use of this delegate, they can actually make uh, ag gain access to this local variable. Since we are actually printing that local variable out, right? You are incrementing that and printing it out. So in this case, the law private members becomes a capture or order variables. And okay, the purpose of this captured variable is to make local variables from the method declaration, uh, declaring an anonymous method available within the delegate itself. So that this will ensure, although uh, although these variables are accessible by the delegates, so uh, making them as a captured variables, it's going to ensure that these values are not accessible uh, outside the delegate. 
So they can be accessible only within the delegate signature in the method here. So n can be accessible only within the delegate. Uh, they cannot be accessed outside the delegate signature. So that's when these local variables termed as a outer variables or captured variables. Okay. So we'll see more of that here. Um, so in this case, uh, if you uh, th so this is on the right hand side. If you see, this is uh, the the assembly uh, disassemble that we're going to uh, we ha have opened up and to demonstrate and see uh, show you uh, how it's going to internally represented uh, represented in the assembly. Uh, if you see that int x, this is a local variable. Although um, since we didn't specify any uh, any uh, modifier here, access modifier here. When we see the representation in the IRDASM in the disassembler, it's actually marked as a public, and also that this variable is captured into another special type of a class, which is referred to as um, with the angular brackets and C underscore display class. So it's actually made this variable as available under an a special class. So similarly for the y as well. So this makes sure that this local variable is accessible by the delegate uh, method that's been implemented. So that's a special a special way the captured variables are handled. Is it really matters for you to care about it? Yes, certainly. So you really need to care about it because uh, certainly you might not want to get into a situation like this but uh, if you uh, ignore this behavior of the captured variables then you're most likely to get into such situation which is going to be troublesome uh, for debugging and also it's going to make your logic more tough a typical example if you take it this way how it's going to behave right in, in this case um, uh, again, again uh, with us for delegates it's always uh, a choice for you to use the delegates with anonymous methods or not if at all you decide to go ahead using anonymous methods, then always make sure that the the uh, the variables that are being used inside your anonymous methods, uh, what type of variables are you making use of them? And uh, so, if at all you're using any local variables in a uh, anonymous method, uh, you need to be aware of the captured variables. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's going to be very very messy. So here, if you see the typical example here, um, uh, in this case, we have an int variable declared outside. And in this case, we are actually making n number of instances of a de given delegate. OK, so this is an array of delegates. So if you see the array concepts, the sum action is nothing but a delegate, right? So in this uh, snapshot, it's not visible. But yes, yeah, so the sum action is a delegate. And we are making an array of uh, sum action in other words instances of uh, some action delegates we have an array of 10 size okay in this case we have a 10 arrays um, of delegates created and we are supplying the, or we are associating the methods using the anonymous methods here we're using the for each loop to get the indexer int i the same index loop and uh, the i is actually declared outside the for loop so that means the i is going to be same throughout the for loop and if you see the y, y is getting a new instance created for every i and what we're doing here is using i that means instance of i we are creating an anonymous method the anonymous method delegate is actually using x and y both okay so if you, if you see this typical example where, where x is incrementing and y is also incrementing at the given so what will happen to the behavior of x and what will happen to the behavior of y. So that's if you see the uh, the statement out. This is again a short form of uh, writing the instance of i dot invoke. In other words, you can actually uh, straight away without using invoke. You can do this way also. Okay, and uh, this is the first instance. How it's going to print? The first instance prints zero zero. Second and the same instance when you invoke it again. It's going to 1, 1. So the x value is getting incremented because x plus plus, y plus plus, right? So whenever this delegate block is called, x is incremented, y is incremented. Okay? And when, if you see the this part, uh, this part of the code, 
uh, where x is printing 3 because x is one copy on the top and y is a gone box to 0. Why? Because y, y instance is separate for every x, right? Whenever you added the y, the separate instance of the y will add up to this block of code. So that's why the y started with 0 again because it has a new y here. And in the, uh, in the previous case, the y value has been incremented because it's using the, its own copy of y. Remember this code here. Whenever you add uh, this anonymous methods to it, it's going to have its own copy created for each of the anonymous method inside this. This is going to be more complicated implementation wise uh, with respect to the compiler, how it's going to treat it. And uh, with respect to the usage wise, it's going to be pretty simple, but if you, uh, the idea behind showing this logic he here is to make sure that you stay away from such kind of a, um, uh, such kind of a coding, uh, wherein you're trying to make use of a lot of local variables inside an anonymous method. So that's going to be a very, very bad practice to do it. Uh, considering the capture variables behavior, uh, it's going to be more uh, troublesome for you to debug. You can never debug uh, uh, if you really want to debug such kind of situation wherein you have an array of uh, delegates created and you each of the delegate is making use of a ton of other local variables. You can never predict what's going to happen. So stay away from such kind of coding. Uh, whenever you make use of anonymous methods, make sure that they are very straight line and single line implementations and they don't use any local variables as such. Although if it is needed, you can still make use of it, but uh, minimize the usage uh, as much as you can. Uh, at the most, one variable is, is the best you can use. More than that, again, it's going to be more troublesome and you should be very, very careful making use of it. So that's the point to highlight at this point. And yes, here uh, after the, yeah, if you, if you see on the other, other case, uh, at the, of the first instance, when we make a collapsed call, the uh, the y value is two, and immediately at this at the last but one, if you see the y value is again continued with two, whereas x value is same uh, throughout all the instances because x value is outside; it's got created only one copy throughout the all the instances, right? And the, whereas y copy has a y has its own copy for every instance, so that's why the y is actually continuing. If it's a two and three here, but uh, for the uh, instance of one, it's actually started with zero there. And again, if you say instance of two, it started with zero again. Whereas an x value got updated to ten here, so x value is ten here. So hope that explains uh, how it's going to behave. Uh, it's important to understand the behavior in, internally. And these are the outer captured variables, the x and y termed as the outer or captured variables because they are used inside the anonymous method uh, and these variables are local scope variables. Okay, so that's all. Uh, yeah, I think I can uh, show you the demo of this code. Yes, we have the captured variables code here. It's the same piece of code. Okay, if you run this out, yeah, this is the same output that we uh, that I just put on the right hand side here. Zero zero one one two two three zero and four three ten zero. Right, so it matches here. So that's the output you will see when you do a law captured variables inside the anonymous methods. Okay, so uh, that's all for uh, now. Okay, in this session 20, we did uh, see the remaining 2.0 features, uh, which is the null coalizing uh, operator. Uh, we did see delegate changes. What are the new delegates uh, uh, introduced in, uh, delegate changes introduced in 2.0, uh, which are the delegate uh, inference, uh, which is, uh, uh, and also we did see the uh, covariance and contravariance uh, specific to the delegates. 
and also we will see anonymous methods uh, which is a very very powerful feature we, uh, especially when we go down uh, its uh, next next level of a more concise uh, way of writing code, uh, we can declare methods without the name and on the fly, wherever you require and we'll see its power when we look into C, when we get to see the link uh, programming as well. Okay, so this is a very, very powerful feature, anonymous methods, uh, we did walk through in a very detailed demo as well. And the last thing we saw is the comp captured variables, so we'll uh, continue with the next topics in the, uh, which covers the C-Sharp 3.0 features in the next session.